Okay, class, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a lecture on Roosevelt's critics. And uh, and I'm going to wing this one because I'm up at my in-law's vacation home and don't have my notes with me, but I think I can do this. So you have a speech by Huey Long, who is one of FDR's critics. On the back side of that are some lecture notes that you can use to... Uh, to follow along with me, and I'm and I'm, I can't remember what order they came in, but but they did. <clears throat> the the first New Deal went very well for FDR in in terms of popular support. He uh, he gave Americans hope. Americans felt like he cared. Americans felt like he was trying and doing something to help them out. And so, if you if you look at the results of the election of 1936. His opponent is going to get only eight electoral votes, which is a political butt whooping for sure. So very, very popular. That being said, he did have his critics, all right. And uh, surprisingly enough, he had critics on both sides of the political spectrum. There were those who felt his New Deal wasn't doing enough, and there were those who felt like it did way too much, all right. And uh, so let me start with the ones who, who felt he did wasn't doing enough for the poor people or the lower middle class people of the United States. Right? Without a doubt, the biggest the biggest critic was, and his most dangerous critic in terms of politics was a senator from Louisiana by the name of Huey Long. Huey the Kingfish Long is what his people called him. Very, very, very popular in the state of Louisiana, very gifted speaker. <laughs> If you uh, if you YouTube him, and not, sometimes I think if you just painted a little mustache like this, he's very dynamic, waves his hand, so and I think he looks like Hitler myself. <laughs> so if you put that little mustache on him, you might get a little Adolf Hitler there. And uh, really felt like Roosevelt was pandering to the wealthy bankers and the investors, the wealthy people of America. You know, felt like Roosevelt should have taken over the banks instead of helping them out to survive, instead of for protecting them, and uh, felt like he wasn't doing enough for poor people. And so what Long proposed was a program called Share Our Wealth. And basically the, the emphasis of this program would be to tax the snot out of the rich people, take the money from the rich people, and redistribute it to the poor people Basically, to give every American $5,000 to buy a home, a car, and a radio. Right? And that's how Huey Long got most of his support was via the radio. Um, and in addition to that, that would also provide $2,500 a year salary income, which was twice the income of the average American at the time. So $5,000 for a house, every man should be a king and have a castle, was his slogan, I believe it was. And then $2,500. And again, where is he going to get this money? He's kind of like Robin Hood. He's going to take it from the rich and give it to the poor. And in fact, Huey Long was going to run for president in 1936 and gained you know, millions of people in support. But in the words of Forrest Gump, <clears throat> somebody shot that man. He was assassinated in 1935 by a local guy in Louisiana who, uh, whose father had been done under by long politics. So, so much for Huey Long. Another critic was a Roman Catholic priest called the radio priest, Father Charles Coughlin. Coughlin? Coughlin? Anyway, uh, again... First game popularity on the radio, which was the medium of the day, giving uh, sermons. He became very popular. But eventually his sermons turned from religion to politics. And he particularly felt that FDR had befriended the bankers, who ought, the money changers as he called them. And uh, he was a Catholic priest, but he was also an anti-Semite, which is a great vocabulary word for you to learn means he was against Jewish people. And it's it's a bit stereotypical, right? But 
a lot of Jewish people in banking. And, and so he was very critical of them. But he had a, a, a following of well over 40 million people on his radio program. Uh, and he had no political aspirations, but he just very critical of FDR and his and how he coddled the bankers is what Fa Father Coughlin uh, said. He he's going to meet not his fate. He's not going to die, but he's going to make some anti-Semitic remarks on the radio that aren't going to go over well, especially with Hitler rising up in Germany over there. So that'll kind of be his his downfall. Uh, as far as that go, but, but for a while, uh, you know, quite a potent critic and uh, enemy of FDR. The third guy on your list is Dr. Francis Townsend, and his main beef was that FDR was not doing enough for the elderly people in America. And uh, his proposal was that elderly people get some kind of pension, which I believe can't remember exact figures, but about $250 a month, which is a lot of money at the time, uh, as a pension to take care of them. At the time, elderly people had nothing. Yet, literally, some people had to work until they died because they, you know, otherwise, what were you going to live off of, right? Because there was no retirement unless you worked for a particular company that offered that, and not too many of them did. So, and, and, Roosevelt actually took his ideas, and in the second New Deal, he's going to pass a program that is a retirement program for elderly people called Social Security. Uh, and maybe that's because of the pressure from Townsend. Maybe it was F on FDR's plate to do anyway. But he'll silence fo Dr. Townsend by, you know, following his plan and coming up with something for the elderly people that, that's going to help them, give them an, an, an income in their elderly age so they don't have to work until they die or, or be a burden to their families. <clears throat> um, then there was a group on the right, the, the people that felt like he didn't, he was doing way too much, turning our country into a, uh, a socialist or a communist country by the amount of government involvement that he was doing and, and uh, basically government taking over a lot, of, particularly the NIRA, which was establishing wages and and uh, uh, quotas and how much production, wages and production of major industries, which is kind of a socialist thing to do. And so maybe their fears weren't totally unwarranted. Probably more fair to say that, that Roosevelt was trying to save capitalism uh, by, by government intervention, that you know if we don't do something to improve this economy, you know, there are people out there who will turn to communism, who will turn to socialism, the U, will turn to Eugene V. Debs, and will crazy people like Huey Long if I don't do something and if the government doesn't get involved somehow. So FDR would say, you know, I, I did increase the size of the government and I did expand the influence of government, but not to take over and change America to a socialist nation, but to save capitalism in the end. That, that's kind of a traditional argument that he uses. So critics like Al Smith, the guy who ran against Hoover in 28, um, oh gosh, you know, again, without my notes in front of me here, uh, there was actually an organization of conservative Democrats and um, Republicans who just felt like FDR's New Deal had gone way, way, way too far. Okay. The, the final critic I think I have there on the list is, is maybe not a critic, but certainly took some steps to, to do some damage to FDR's first New Deal, and that was the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I mentioned it before in other lectures that the Supreme Court declared two of FDR's programs unconstitutional. The first one was the NIRA, uh, and I'll take that one. Uh, their beef with the NIRA, and, and, and the name of the political court case, and you should know this one, it's, it should be on your top 10 Supreme Court cases, <clears throat> is the Schechter Poultry Company versus New York. Okay. And uh, they were, uh, they sued because they, they had uh, violated some wage restrictions that had been set up under the NRA, and uh, 
And so they sued in a court of law saying, you know what, you can't really do this to us. And what the Supreme Court found, and this is important to understand the reasoning of why they found it unconstitutional, that number one, um, Congress was giving up its lawmaking powers to a regulatory agency, and that regulatory agency was the NRA, um, the National Recovery Administration. So you can't do that. You can't give lawmaking powers to them. They're the ones establishing the, the wages. They're the ones establishing production quotas. And that's your job, Congress. <clears throat> so you can't give that kind of power to a regulatory agency. The other problem was that the Schechter Poultry Company operated strictly within the state of New York and therefore is not subject to any federal uh, interstate commerce laws because their product did not leave the state of New York. So for those two reasons, the NIRA was declared unconstitutional. The other one was the AAA, the Agricultural Administration Act. And the problem there, if you remember, was that uh, farmers were being paid not to produce crops, trying to bring the, the price of crops up. The question is, where were they getting the money to pay them? <laughs> they, uh, they got it from the, oh, what do they call that? Uh, the places that were, were the, the, the mills and the granaries that were taking whatever crops the farmers grew and turned them into bread, turned them into grain, turned them into flour, right? Um, the processors, that's the word I'm looking for, the processors. Tax the processors to pay the farmers not to grow crops. And, and simply what the Supreme Court said is you cannot tax one small group of people to then take that money and pay another small group of people. You can tax everybody and use that money to pay them. You can use government money, but you can't tax the processors and use it to pay the other group. Okay? So both of those declared unconstitutional. And uh, that's going to impact, FDR is going to try something in his second administration. And there's going to be um, another, and that, I'm going to have to, I'm getting a little long here and it won't prove, so I will talk about FDR and the Supreme Court on the next lecture.